So I'm Matthew, Matthew Law. I'm one of four boat building tutors here at the Boat Building Academy, which is a school of boat building and now a school of furniture making as well. Two schools under one roof. And we're here in Lyme Regis on the Jurassic Coast at the Dorset end of things. So I hope to show you around the whole place. And so the 40 week course starts up here. Yeah. When what we call a six week foundation course. And that's kind of, it's an hour in the classroom every morning about underlying principles of stuff to do with boats, stuff to do with boat building, stuff to do with materials. So timber technology, you know, starting from trees and timber conversion and seasoning and all that stuff. Stuff to do with glue, stuff to do with different kinds of mechanical fastening. So that's all the classroom stuff. And then the, the first six weeks is we kind of major on joinery. Here we are. So we introduce people to the different families of joints. So that's these are haunched mortise and tenons. The, the haunching that bit stops the short bit twisting, doesn't it? If it was just the width of the tenon, I'd be able to twist that bit. So, and this is all done with hand tools. And mortise and tenons are kind of framing joints. So there are different families of joints. And then here we have widening joints. That's a loose tongue. So when you're jointing up, you'll see downstairs, people jointing up transom out of multiple boards in the same way as you might make a tabletop. So widening joints, and then what else we got? The classic one in boat building, which is what people are doing here on this short course, is scarf joints, so lengthening joints. If you're making furniture, you can buy wood that's longer than, the biggest piece of furniture you'll ever make is a bed or a refectory table. You can buy wood that's longer than that. So you don't need lengthening joints, but on boat building, you do need lengthening joints because the, the boat might be 60 foot long, you're not gonna buy wood at that length. So you need to find ways of making bits of wood longer. And also, because often the wood's curved, so you want to keep good grain orientation along its length. So you'll joint it in order to maintain good grain orientation. So the kind of different kinds of lengthening joints, we do are different kinds of scarf. So that's a glued feather scarf. You shouldn't, you can hardly see it in. So a glued feather scarf is a really strong joint and that's the same thing in plywood. And then we do a, a variety of things with, so that's a keel scarf. So there's a lip there. I don't think I see it. And a hook in the middle and a lip at the other end. So that's, that's more like the, a joint you'd have in a centerline structure rather than a plank scarf. And it's in the other orientation. Plank scarfs tend to be going through that way. This is going through in the narrow sense, isn't it? So, and what other, and then of course, the other obvious family of joints is kind of box joints. So that's, that's a kind of hopper dovetail, a beveled dovetail. So that's quite advanced. And if you wanted to set that out, the geometry associated with it is quite complicated. So the setting out is almost as difficult as cutting the joint with that. And this is so a draw front dovetail, if I can find one. So that's a through dovetail, which you can see on both sides. So that's a draw front dovetail. So on the draw front, you wouldn't, you'd have to look at the size of the draw to see that it's a draw front dovetail. And we try and have, we try and have little models to show people how to cut it. So if you're cutting a draw front dovetail, you start out with a slope and then gradually you chop away the slope, top and bottom. And then last of all, you make the socket ready to receive the tails. So those are the main families of joints, lengthening joints, widening joints, framing joints, which is mortise and tenons. 
So you'd see in furniture, you'd see those in tables and chairs and door frames and so on. So they're the main families of woodworking joints. And the idea is that people learn joinery by doing all this kind of stuff. Joinery is very unforgiving. Generally, there's a kind of male and female element to each component. And Woodworking is essentially reductive, isn't it? You use woodworking tools to take wood away. Um, and so it enforces discipline on you. So learning dovetails is great. So you learn how to do dovetails, but also teaches you principally about sawing. When, we, when you do dovetails, we want them to fit straight off the saw. So it's kind of messing around for hours with chisels, trying to improve them is a bit of a mugs game, really. Very often, you know, if they're gappy, you can't do anything about that because woodworking is reductive. As the great Jack Chippendale used to say, he used to say, I haven't brought my putting on plane today, you know, just because if you've removed too much wood, that's it, isn't it? You're, you're slowly screwed. So this is the first six weeks happens up here. And then, well, then we go into lots of kind of modular weeks. We'll do a week of oil and spa making. So here's a couple of So this is a pretty classic spoon bladed all. So we teach the principles of spa making by making just one all each to start with. They'll make more and they'll make spas. But the principles of and I can show you a model downstairs. The principles of going from square to round, we teach by making the oar. And also, there's a bit of sculptural work in doing the spoon blade. And to do the spoon blade, they need a rounded, a round soled plane, which I can show you downstairs. So they make, a, as part of the foundation, they make the plane which they'll need subsequently to make the spoon blade at all. So it's a really nice sculptural thing. There's an element of being quite sculptural and then there's an element of being super disciplined in terms of um, going from square to eight size to 16 sides and then it up. A 40 week course in the first three weeks we decide wh which which boats this group of people are going to build for their boat projects and that needs to be decided early because quite often we'll be ordering plans from the States, maybe from a museum. It takes a while for plans to arrive. Uh, we sometimes do, do things um, from books. So we'll kind of magnify a, a little lines drawing in a book and do it that way. And then we have to create our own table of offsets and so on. Um, but when we, when we select the project boats, we try and have a mix of construction types so downstairs we're building six boats so one is carvel one is traditional clinker one is glue clinker one is cold molded one is strip planked and one is oh one is wide plywood panels which only will bend in certain ways so which is quite an instructive thing so they need to bend in conic curves and it's a stitch and glue method which gets a really bad press but it's a fabulous Boat building method. You get to a hull shape very quickly and then you can spend your time making it pretty and fitting it out. And the reason we, we make those decisions early is week seven and eight of the course are where we loft the boats full size. So lofting is where you take a line drawing and you enlarge it full size. And I, I don't know if there's one in here I could show you. Yeah, so that's, this is the classic line drawing which my colleague has been annotating with his red pen. So that's three views of the boat, which is great. So, but it's not enough because we need full size patterns for, for the building models and we need a full size pattern for that shape of the stem in profile. And we need a full size pattern for the transom. And we also need detail of the rabbit, which is where the planking, the whole skin meets the centerline structure, which is a really critical part of the boat. So, it, whoops, sorry, enlarging that full size. So here is actually, when we're doing the 
the lofting of the same boat. So the boat's a 12 foot boat, so the lofting will be 12 foot long and somewhere. Oh, there we go, the thing behind. So that's the full size enlargement of that boat, and you'll probably see little marks on it, which is where we made patterns, picked up patterns off the off the lofting. So these little marks are where we've used a nail head impression technique to pick up patterns to enable us to make the building moulds. And you'll see loads of sets of building moulds downstairs. So that's lofting, which is week seven and eight. And then, then there are the other modular bits. I've already talked about ore and spar making, sail making, a week of sail making, a week of engineering and systems. My mind goes blank about what the other weeks are. And then oh, a week of painting and finishing. And then in among also the city and guilds assessed assignments. And I'll show you some of those downstairs, the city and guilds assessed assignments. So that's the, that's the stem pattern for this boat with all the important lines which, which define the, the rabbit, which you can see there, you can imagine, in, in profile view, if I was looking from the side, that's one line, that's the second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, so there are going to be at least five lines across that stem. And there, you see them. So that, that stem pattern enables us to actually get on and laminate up the stem for this boat. We could do it out of solid, and that's what you'll see downstairs. The current, our, our examination assignments change over time. The current um, woodwork city and guilds assignments, they make a stem for this boat, but they make it, instead of laminating it up, they make it out of solid, and I can show you some examples. So let's go, let's head downstairs. This is another thing we do, we do teach, is we teach the business of stitch and glue boat building and, and someone has been experimenting putting a deck on this tiny little dinghy. So, by using modern construction methods. So this is actually a piece of plywood to simulate what we were doing this to a plywood boat. So that's the raw wood, that's coated with epoxy and then it's glassed and in fact it's got peel ply on it. So, in fact, that, that's just glass, and the finer weave is by putting peel ply over it. That's with the peel ply ripped off, and then that's a fairing compound to fill the weave, and that's been sanded back, and then that's a high build primer undercoat, and last of all, you can't really see the reflection on it, but there's a shiny top coat up there if I put it there you can maybe see the reflection on it. So that's kind of an abbreviation of the stages we would often go through to get to finish top sides. You know it's not just build a boat and slap a coat of paint on it there's all these intermediate stages or very often there are all these intermediate stages. But the designer when he drew it he actually drew it yeah, I don't know if you can see there, for a traditionally jointed stem. So there's a bit of wood down there and another bit along the bottom and a kind of knee element in the middle. And I'll show you an example of exactly that. So that's now our examination assignment. And these are the building mould patterns made off that lofting which we use to make the real, you know, obviously these are too lightweight, they're nothing more than patterns. We use those to, to make the building moulds. And in fact, there's a set of sterling board building moulds made using those templates. And I can tell, when I look at that set of building moulds, it's designed for upside down building because the building molds 
even this is the shear, this is the top of the boat, but the building moulds have been carried on down to a common baseline. So that when I, and you'll see this downstairs, I can just stand them up and I know they're all in the right place-ish, right height. And I don't know if you can see the light coming through here, just by chance. This is a jig for cold moulding. Because cold moulding is boat shaped plywood. We've got an, there's an example of a bit of cold moulding off that jig just by the window at the top of the stairs there. So it's boat shaped plywood, it's done with thin veneers. You can imagine if I'm trying to bend thin veneers around this, I need more than just moulds every couple of feet. So you set up moulds just as you would with any other build and then, then you have to batten the jig longitudinally so that the veneers stay side by side as you're building. So this is a bit of a restoration project. This is a little Morgan Giles thingy who was one of the great kind of southwestern boat builders. Morgan Giles were at Tynmouth, which is not far down the coast. And we're, you know, one of the really big employer. It was a big, big firm in its heyday, like a lot of them. So this is a bit of a basket case, but should be good by the time it's done. Here, we're, this is, the students have occupied this workshop for a week now, and this is the beginning of the second part of the course where they kind of build the project base. So still, you know, we had a classroom session this morning. There's still classroom sessions, there are still modules in among, but it's really focused now on building the project base. So if I just, I'll just point at it. So that's a, strip planked hull being built upside down that's just inside the door you can't really tell the construction type yet because they've, they've only just set the building molds up so you, you've got no way of telling what method but i, I can tell you because i happen to know um just inside the windows there catching the light that's a 14 foot glue printer outboard fishing mold really is what that will be so, glue clinker we tend to build upside down. And that one over there, which is quite beamy, is a 16 foot double ended, cold molded sailing boat with an electric inboard and conventional shaft and prop. So, conventional engine installation, but with an electric motor is the plan for that and, and over there when we go around you can see the drawings for it it's, it's gonna fascinate it's a double ended boat with a short bowsprit and a latin rig so it's a kind of almost like a maltese boat it's a kind of mediterranean boat here in the middle is the boat we're building with white plywood panels and this is a coral boat and actually we're building it quite light and we're going to build it glued carbol. Some people would say that's not possible. I know you can't, you can't glue carbol. Well, we kind of do quite often. The main thing is once you've planked, once you've got a plank on, you want to not allow the moisture content to change. So we seal it up as you, as you plank. And so it's, the planks are edge glued and then we will probably see the inside and out with glass in much the same way as you would do with a strip plank boat so but it's a cobble boat so it's good so it has the exercise of the difficulty and the skills of hollowing out the inside of planks where they round the curve of the building molds round the turn of the bilge and um the business of lining off and spiling planking so it's a it's very technical compared to strip planking. But, so that, that's the nice mixture. And then the one which which you can't really tell at the moment is the boat that's going to be built here is this 18 foot Nick Smith launch with a 20 horsepower diesel and conventional shaft and tube installation. So that will be traditional planker. That will be planked in, blotch, and then steam on a kind of oak and mahogany combination centerline structure. So that's the transom jointed up out of 
Uh, jointed lateral line at six boards, so that's oak. The outer stem, which will be left bright and visible, is going to be oak. The kind of inner apron, it's got a very tight forefoot. You know, classic plum stem launch, long keel. Sometimes the stem used to be, is still tenoned into the keel in a kind of L shape. Here, <coughs> we've got quite a tight lamination, so it's done using very thin veneer, it's just two and a quarter mil. And on the inside, where the radius is tighter than on the outside, the veneers were soaked in order to get them to go around the corner. And this is the beginnings of the horn timber and deadwood. So it's quite a complicated piece of joinery. So that, that's kind of that bit there. So in fact, it's that way up, are you with me? And so the tube will go through there. So not entirely straightforward. And this will be built the right way up. So that they're mechanically fastened using copper rivets. And the reason we build the right way up, one is just a variation from everything else we happen to be doing here. And so you can see what you're doing with a hammer when you, so you, Clinker planking, you have to plank from the keel to the shear, so you can fasten as you go and you can see what you're doing with a hammer. That's the... Thing. You can see lots of laminated stems and aprons in progress. And this is, this is one of the um, City and Guilds assessed assignments. So this is a jointed stem and it's been, had the rabbit cut ready for planking. This one's actually very good. So you can see, if you're gonna to go to all this trouble, if you don't make it ready for planking, you're a bit of a mug really, you know. This, is, this isn't gonna ever get wet. This is a kind of examination piece, an assignment piece. Um, but this is the oak jointed stem for this boat behind me. So again, jointed out from three pieces. At the moment, it's glued together. It's been drilled for some big copper fastenings, and it will be jointed into the rest of the central structure, and we'll plank into a rabbit on this. Even though it's a kind of modern construction, we think that we will still plank into a rabbit. Each of these boats has been lofted. So that's the lofting for this boat. Some of the other loftings are being kind of modified and still being worked on. So the lofting for Andy's boat is in the back corner. So there is a lofting available for each boat. Yeah. This is kind of one of our classrooms. It's slightly chaotic. It's being used as a bit of a tool store and people are modifying the loftings. And but we had a classroom session in here this morning and we kind of use it as a workshop there. You can see school laws, some of which have been varnished in the painting and finishing week. Instead I'll show you plane. That's the little plane that the students make in order to be able to make the oar. So it's curved across and curved along its length. Um, and so they make that during the foundation. And this is a smaller version of the planes we use when we're doing carbon planking. So we use these curved, we call them bolo planes. So the ones we use for carbon planking tend to be a bit bigger. Let's see if I can find one. So this is the classic school toolbox. <laughs> so that's a medium sized one. We would use that for carbon planking, but ideally I'd use one slightly bigger. That's kind of dingy stuff, really. That's um, not in them. <laughs> I've been working here on and off since 2000. Four part time to start with, 
and but I, I came here as a student sometime prior to that and then I worked at Latham's in Poole for six years. Yeah. Which was fun. Yeah. And but I started working here part time before I finished at Latham's. This is what I wanted to do. So this just demonstrates how we go from square section to eight sides and then to 16 sides and then actually we wouldn't bother so you can see the traces of pen lines we wouldn't bother setting out any further than that but we'd probably just take those sharp arises off and go to 16 sides and then we round it up and you round it up with planes and then the sanding is just about surface finish but the actual rounding up is done with planes so that's kind of quite a nice illustration of the of the spar making process if you like tapering so if you were if you have a bermudan sail with a straight luff you don't want any taper on the mast because then that would stretch the leech of the sail the, the luff groove has got to be straight so on a bermudan mast this is tapered but it's only tapered on so if this was a mast, this would be the aft face and we'd have the rough groove or track on the back, which is completely straight. So all the taper is on the two sides and on the front. And so you obviously, you need to do the tapering before you start the rounding up. If you, it might be possible to do it in the other order, but, and kind of remnants here of teaching GRP. So I'll show you our little GRP shot. And this is a hollow, this is the loom of a Cornish pilot giggle, which is constructed as a hollow box section. So that's another way you can make balls and spars. The bird's mouth spar. So it's made from eight staves. Each one is quarter sawn. So the grain pattern is identical all the way around the mast which of course you can't get with a pole mast like this. If this was a pole mast, you have the growth rings really close together there and then at some point it's very flat sawn and flamey, isn't it? So with the conventional mast, you'll see the grain orientation change all the way around. This is the same all the way around and it's also incredibly stiff. If I, um, let's just find the but it's just lunatically stiff. It's much it's much stiffer than a solid spar would be because of its construction. A fortnight of GLP and we also do a, a, a week around deck construction and laying on decks and fitting deck beam joints and so on. So so we do this 12 week furniture design and making course. So it starts from scratch in a very similar but slightly more compressed foundation than the boat builders do. So they have their own little machine shop here, the furniture team, and a bench each. Obviously they're out of lunch now. So the, the it's to a level three qualification, so there are some assessed assignment pieces, and then there's a kind of design and make for their own project. Obviously, there's a limit to the extent and complexity that it's possible to achieve in 12 weeks if you're starting from scratch. But it's very impressive, some of the pieces that come out from this 12-week course. So I think it's great, and this is a lovely space too. We're not fighting and struggling with the logistics of a 20 foot plank up on staging so you can actually learn the techniques without any of the ridiculous problems of trying to manipulate heavy bits of wood and so on. So it works really well and there's a bit of shape so they have to hollow out the inside of the plank in order to get it to fit back onto the frames and so it's very conventional. So we typically we screw into the big frames a copper rivet onto the small steam frames. 
And so someone's been doing a bit of corking, that's a bit of oakum. Sometimes we'll cork with cotton as well. And you can see, we try and minimize its use on the jig. You can see traces of where someone's had red lead powder in the linseed putty. We don't generally, we well, just mix it up for demonstration purposes, then throw that away. And people, if they want to putty up, if they want to pay the cork seam, they'll just use straight linseed putty without the red lead in it. Here's someone that got away. So, because it's kind of not very nice stuff for health reasons. So this is another card from where we bought it out the floor recently for sail making. So we can put pins and tacks in the floor and bend battens around. Because underneath here is a concrete floor. Um, which is no good for sail making. So it's now got a nice wooden floor and we try and fail. We try and keep this a bit clean for sail making, but it's quite easy to kind of sweep and mop. So there will be a sail making course in here next week actually. Hence, all the sail cloths and all the accoutrements and a couple of sail machines. So kind of walking foot sail machines to enable you to do Slightly. If you've got a French seam joint meeting a French seam joint, you've got to go through quite a few layers of cloth. So you need a moderately oomphy cloth. And then other than when it's not being used for cell making, it's used for all sorts of different classroomy purposes and it's used for painting and finishing. For our short on our short course menu, there's traditional cell making, which is more hand sewing in canvas and sewing in bolt ropes and all the rest of it. And there's a modern sail making course. In general, we're using, for the boats we build here, we're using modern cloths. Sometimes they're kind of faux old, you know, clipper canvas and all those kinds of things um, to make them so they appear like old canvas sail cloth. But in general, we're using modern cloths and polyester thread, usually waxed polyester thread. So most of the sails of the boats we build these days are built, most of the sails are built by the students in the sail making week of their course. And we haven't got enough space, so it's only a proportion, is the groups, for a lot of the courses are divided into smaller groups. So we might have four or five guys sail making, some others at the same time, some of them making oars, some of them doing their city and guilds assignments, and then they all move around for them. So really the most we could have sail making in here is probably, I don't know, eight or nine max. Old city and guild assessed assignments from um, the, G the GRP. So, now we're doing a kind of boat joinery assignment instead of this, but it's small because it has to be an individual project. So they, it's a hand layout hull and a vacuum consolidated deck and then bonded together and they're assessed on the quality of finish and so on and so on. And, um, So we've got big floor level extraction. We can really wrap the heat up and we can keep it up because it's actually surprisingly well insulated. And we keep all the nasties in terms of dust and styrene vapors. And you can see that's a vacuum pump for a vacuum consolidation. So the GRP these days, because it used to be two weeks, so it'd be a week course including repairs, and a week for that assessed assignment, that little model boat. Now it's really only going to be one week, probably, because when the, we no longer do the GRP as an assessed assignment. We've got two woodwork assessed assignments. So, yeah. And you can see the bits of blue string hanging from the ceiling is where we've been using this as a painting and finishing shop and hanging spars and other bits of joinery from that. So that's for 
Yeah, that um, uh, jointed stem, the oak stem. I was. Hello, Schnooks. I heard your footsteps. Um, I don't know if you saw it. It's, it's stepped, and so we use this jig to do with with a stepping, running running a template against that guide bush. So we have a. Router in a sled to do the stepping of that stem. This is what we refer to as our small machine shop, and the students have access to this after hours, which is probably different to any other establishment. That's very unusual, and it's a boon for them. Um, so, basically, yeah. hello, chisel, monster, pillow drill, shop tool, overhang planer, router table. Baby thing, it's a small thing, it's a small table saw, orbit sander, disc sander, and a lathe. So it's all quite small scale. And then I'll show you the big machine saw. And this is our big machine shop and timber store. So here we've got a big, so this is all kind of, there is a little baby fitness too, like the one next door, but this is all big free face stuff. <laughs> big plane of fitness, so, so you can put wood over the top and underneath and a big dimension saw. And then the palette of boat building timbers is relatively small compared to furniture making. Furniture making you can use pretty much any species, hundreds of different species. The palette of boat building timbers in Northern Europe is a dozen species, you know. So if, it, if you're making a mast, it will be spruce or Douglas. That's it, that's what it will be. And you, you know, you look at the ads in back of boat building magazines, it says larch on oak. So we, we're doing that launch we're building is larch on oak. So it's a relatively small number of species. Sapili, this tulip wood, we use for joinery exercises. That examined stem, the the, assessor, the city and guilds assessed assignment stem, you might have noticed it's that kind of yellowy colour. Tulip was not durable, it's not a boat building timber, but we use it for teaching joinery and for the assessed assignments. So we don't keep a huge variety of woods and we don't keep huge stalks. It just not make sense for us. And you can just see Portland there, away from you. And the visibility is not so good, it's a bit hazy today, but you can usually look down and see bits of the South Devon coast away to the west. So we're in, we're, you know, surprisingly, Lyme Regis is in the middle of Lyme Bay. So it's a brilliant spot to be, particularly when the weather's like this. Yeah. The, the lookout is, is one of the sought-after bedrooms. And sometimes people, when they're, when they're looking around years before they do the course, they, say, they kind of got that out right. When I come, I want to be in the lookout. Okay. Right. This white shed, so this is our car park, this white shed is the... Um, Lyme Regis Gig Club and Lyme Regis has three wooden Cornish pilot gigs and they were all built in the school. Ah. Not all by students. The first one was a, was a school project and which had student participation in it and a kind of professional lead. Gail McGarver, the well-known wooden boat builder, who was a student here in the school. And then she took contracts for the next two. Oh, this is the boat. Um, oh. He said the bottom fell out. <laughs> what, what's your verdict on this boat, Matt? Do you um, think that looks... Um, royally, <laughs> not, not worth... Um, you got sent some photos and it, it's just... I mean, it would be possible if someone was willing to pay huge amounts of money, but effectively there would be nothing, there's nothing there that you'd want to put, you'd want to keep. So it's basically a new build. 
and because it's lost its shape so badly you'd struggle to measure it in a in a way that you could have confidence that you were building a replica so it's kind of it's sad but it's been let go too far so that's oh, wow so this is a cornish skiff in the foreground which is a carval build so smooth skinned but traditionally built Built in our main workshop. Is that this one? And it's the original Lion Regis Cornish pilot gig. So they have three wooden ones, of which Rebel is the first, and they have a couple of plastic ones now as training boats and winter boats. And so the youth section of the club, and you can. So the Cornish skiff, you can row it one person with two oars as a kind of single skull. You can have two two people with two oars each as a kind of double skull. You have two people with one oar each. Or you, there's a Cornish thing which I've ran down, where you have one oar in the bows, and then the person in the middle has two oars, and the person aft has a single oar. So you have three people with four oars in total. So it's kind of very versatile. And it's lo lovely to row. It's a gorgeous thing. So this is, these are our nearest neighbors, the, the Cornish Pilot Gig Club. Great.